Um, right here is Brother Mahmoud, the co-founder of the Rahman Institute. He is finishing up his master's in clinical counseling and Islamic studies, and he comes to the Plano Masjid to do a lot of counseling sessions. I actually met him because we're both Sunday school teachers. But here you go, Brother Mahmoud. Sorry for being late. Don't have a good excuse for that, but uh, I live a little bit further away, so I'm just kind of stuck in traffic. Uh, so I appreciate you guys uh, sticking around and waiting on the night shuttle. We will find this to be a beneficial session and hopefully learn from each other as well, inshallah. So let's officially get started. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ali Muhammad wa barak sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless our gathering, to inshallah give us the strength to follow in the footsteps of our beloved Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and to inshallah practice, practice what we learn inshallah. So I know on the flyers it says that this goes till 8 o'clock, right? Inshallah right around Maghrib time, but I know you guys are college students and probably start getting hungry and tired around Maghrib time. So inshallah, we'll try, to, uh, we'll try to finish a little bit before Maghrib and do like a Q&A. Um, do you guys typically handle Q&A like by just raising your hands or... I have index cards too so we can pass those around. If you guys want to do that, inshallah. Um, if you guys have any questions during the session, we'll uh, get those answered hopefully at any point. You know, guys, we'll keep it informal if you guys want to, inshallah, you might just open this up and yep. pass it around. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If you guys have any questions as we're talking, feel free to raise your hand. Because um, I want this to be interactive, I want this to be engaging, I want this to, inshallah, be beneficial for you guys. So whatever you guys have, any questions you guys have, feel free to raise your hand. And, you know, I think two hours might seem like long, but, you know, this is one of those topics that I think is kind of interesting to everyone, right? I mean, any topic that has the words love, gender relationships, dating, right, typically attracts a pretty good crowd. Even people that don't come to any other halakha, they show for this one, right? And typically the guy that falls asleep in any, in any other speech will stay awake at this one and take really good notes. So you might be seeing people for the first time here today and you're like, I didn't even know that person who goes to school here, right? So, but this is one of those topics where I think all of us uh, want to learn about. And I think there's, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, I think it's part of uh, human nature, right? No matter what religion or what culture you come from, you know, Allah put inside of us, God put inside of us, this wanting to be loved, right? This wanting to have a companion. This wanting to feel accepted and respected by someone else. So this is a human element which Allah put inside of us. And there's a beautiful verse in the Quran that Allah teaches us a dua that we can make. It's in Surah Furqan. Surah Furqan is Surah 25. Verse 74. So if you guys have a Quran, you can follow with me, inshallah. But in this, in this surah, Allah teaches us, and He says, O oh Rabb, O oh Lord, grant us spouses and children that are a comfort or a coolness to our eyes. A comfort or a coolness to our eyes. Did anyone hear this verse here before? Yeah? Yes. Yeah? Pretty popular verse. You typically hear it like at weddings, right? Or maybe when a kid is born. And the, and the phrase, a coolness to your eyes, is used a lot by Allah. You know, when uh, Musa, السلام, Prophet Moses, was returned back to his mom in Surah al qasas right? Allah says that Musa, or Moses, was given back to his mom so his mother would have a comfort in her eyes, right? Or the Prophet وسلم, he described his prayer as what? As a coolness to his eyes, right? So typically, the Arabs, they would use this phrase, a coolness to their eyes. It's kind of like how in English we say, you know what, I have tears of joy, right? Like if you're really happy or you're really excited about something, you have tears of joy, right? You guys heard that, from, that term before, right? So the Arabs, they would typically use this term like, for example, if they're overly excited or happy or content with something that happened in their life. Or they would also use it when they overcame some type of difficulty, and that difficulty passed, and now they had comfort, they would say, we have a comfort. Allah has granted us a comfort in our eyes. And the best example of this is, you know, when the Arabs, 
when they would travel in the deserts, right? They're traveling, and in the middle of their travel, they get stuck like in a sandstorm, right? And they can't see where they're going, only their camel could guide them where they're going, right? And they finally take refuge like in a cave or some type of shelter. They would say, oh, we have a comfort to our eyes, we have a coolness of our eyes. And in the same way in this prayer, Allah is asking us to give us a wife or a husband or kids that have a coolness to our eyes. Because the essence of a marriage or a family relationship is, you know, after a long day of work, maybe, maybe a long day at school, you finally come home. And what do you want to do when you get home? You want to unwind, right? You want to relax. You want to have a home you go to where there's no arguments and there's no disagreements, where there's love and mercy and tranquility in that house, right? So this is why Allah teaches us this dua in the Quran, that we should pray for a comfort of our eyes, inshallah. And you know, this is I think one of those topics that, you know, I used to coach uh, high school basketball when I was in, uh, in, in, uh, in college in Chicago. So I had this kid uh, during one of my practices, he came up to me, 14 year old kid, he memorized the Quran, he's a hafiz, he came up to me and he said, hey coach, I think I found the one. But I'm like, the one, like what? The one, the car you wanna buy? Maybe the college you wanna to go to? He's like, no, I think I found the girl I wanna marry. So I'm like, dude, you're 14 years old. I'm like, I'm like, he's like, yeah, yeah, I know I'm 14, but you know, I talked to her about it, and I think we got a plan in place, and we're, we're gonna make this work. And I'm like, all right, cool. Let's see where that goes, right? So the next practice, I came up to him, I'm like, hey, so, so what happened with that, you know, with that whole marriage thing you're working on? He's like, you know what, we decided it's not really working out right now, and you know, plus I'm only 14, I'm, I'm gonna wait a little bit longer, right? So, you know what, since we're young, I remember being in college, right? After MSA meetings, maybe late at night, all the guys stay up playing Xbox, but then also talking about, hey, who's gonna get married first, right? <laughs> or you know, who's gonna be that lucky sister that, that we have? And I'm sure the sisters have the same conversations, right? So this is like a, a natural conversation that we all wanna have, right? So, so that's the gist of what we're gonna do today. That's the gist of our conversation, inshallah. And I wanna make it interactive, so if you guys have any, any things that you guys wanna add to it, please, Please feel free to do so, inshallah. So, the four things I want to cover today. Can you guys see this okay, or should I dim the lights again? It's good? All right, I don't want to dim the lights because you guys will fall asleep on the So, the four things I want to cover. Number one, true love. What is true love? I know all of us probably have our own definition of what true love is, especially if you watch Hunger Games, Twilight, etc., etc., right? But what truly is true love? So we're going to define that, inshallah. Number two, I want to talk about how to go about finding that special person. Right? I know we all have these dreams about your love at first sight, so on and so forth, right? So how do we go about making that a reality and finding a person that we can connect to and really enjoy their company for the rest of our life, inshallah. Number three, I want to talk about some of the keys to a relationship. What are the keys to keeping your marriage successful? Anyone here already married? So we can learn from you guys. All right, cool. A few of you guys, come to that. All right, inshallah. So yeah, so what are some things that we could do, inshallah, to keep ourselves happily married ever after, inshallah? How about how many of you guys engaged? Anyone here engaged? Anyone looking to get married? Trick question, because all the guys raise your hand. I guess I should look at you. So, so all of us fall in those categories somewhere, right? So either we're married, looking to get married, or probably already engaged, right? And then lastly, inshallah, we'll do a Q&A. For the Q&A, I would really appreciate it if you guys can uh, write your questions down. Uh, besides raising your hands, I mean, I don't mind that, but sometimes I'll be like in the middle of a thought. That way, if you just write it down, I can look at it, capture it, and then we'll, we'll, we'll be able to answer that question, inshallah, if that works for everyone. So let's start with um, how society typically defines love, okay? How, does, how, do, how do all of us have our perception of love, all right? Is it from the books we read? Is it from the internet? So I'm actually gonna, uh, I wanna make this interactive, so I'm gonna have you guys answer this question. And, but by the way, quick fact on this. It's not just us looking for the answer to this. In 2012, one of the most searched Google searches was what is love. Interesting, right? So 
It's not just us Muslims looking for this, right? But everyone wants to know what's, what's true love, okay? So acti activity number one. You don't have to raise your hands because this is going to be embarrassing, I guess, right? But here's what I want you guys to do. Take out paper, if you're old school like me, pen and paper. If not, use your cell phones or your tablets or your laptops. I want you guys to give me three to five examples of what influences people's perception of love. Okay? Three to five examples of what influences people's perception of love. Does that question make sense? Yeah? All right, I'll give you guys like a minute, two minutes, inshallah. How does society typically define love? So I'm like, I'm not going to say this a lot of Haram, but I want you guys to, you know, I tell them, I'm like, so I made them actually like write down the lyrics of a lot of the songs they listen to on the whiteboard. And they're like, wait, wait, we can't write this down on the budget. This is, you know, a lot of the words are kind of bad and stuff. And so I literally had them write down, like, some of the main songs on the whiteboard. And this is like when Imam Yassim was writing together with him. He actually walked into my room. What is that? All these, like, curse words and, like, <laughs> But the point was, I mean, to your point, right? Like music a lot of times defines to us what, how, you know, our relationship should be with the opposite gender, right? How about, um, how about like social media? How about social media? Does that typically define? Yeah. Yeah, right. And there's like a study going on recently that says that typically our perception of who we should be is influenced by social media, right? So you know, like when you look at images of someone else, you know, we compare ourselves to that image and say. Do I have the same looks? Do I have the same, you know, um, hair? Do I have the same, you know, build or weight, whatever it is, as someone else in social media? So it's not just about how a celebrity looks, but it's also about because you know everyone takes selfies now, right? So now you're comparing yourself to other normal people and how they look. So you guys are right, yeah. So society and you know, there's a lot of things in our society that defines to us what love is. You know, TV shows. Dramas, Pakistani dramas, <laughs> movies, you know, the media, right? Books, magazines, internet, culture, right? I'm sure just in this room, right, we have different different types of culture. And each culture defines how, you know, a husband or a wife interacts. I come from a Indian, Pakistani, Desi culture, right? Where, you know, typically the, the man is always told, you know, the woman has to cook and show respect and so on and so forth, right? A lot of it which goes against their religion, but because it's part of our culture, that's typically how we define what love is. Parents, right? Someone mentioned parents, coworkers, friends, social media. So a lot of these things tell us what love is, okay? And there was a study done in 2012 by the scientist. And he, what he did is he researched, he asked about 400 people that typically watch TV and watched movies and read books, and they were also married, right? So they already were in a relationship. And he asked how, he wanted to find out how what they interact with via media, how it influences their own relationship, okay? And he found that people that 
got their expectations for what a marriage or a relationship should be from a movie or a book who are actually dissatisfied in their actual own relationship, right? Because maybe their husband or their wife was not as good looking as the guy in Twilight, right? Maybe um, how a husband and wife interact in a book or a TV show isn't what really happens in real life, right? So you often have your expectations really high because society defines what those expectations are. But when you really, when you get married, sometimes those expectations are not met, right? So I want to show you guys something that he says in this study. So uh, before I do that, one thing I want you guys to keep in mind is that for today, if you guys want to make today work, inshallah, and, and really benefit from it, I want you guys to reset your perspective on love. Reset what you think love is, okay? Reset any other you know, theory or any other influence you've had of what defines love. Because today, inshallah, we start from the basic and define what love is from the ground up, inshallah. So this, the scientist, um, Dr. Jeremy Osborne, so let's make this interactive. Does anyone want to read the screen? Read his, uh, his little passage here. Any volunteers? Yes, go for it. In this study, I found that people who believe unrealistic portrayals on TV are actually less committed to their spouses and think the alternatives to their spouse are relatively attractive. My hope would be that people would read this article and take a look at their own relationships and the relationships of those around them. Yeah. So, so I mean, the important point here is that don't let society define what love is. Inshallah, it's up to us to define what that love is based upon our religion, based upon you know, true cultural you know, um, aspects that have good funded morals and foundation, but then also what the Prophet Wasallam teaches us in his sunnah. Right? So that's what we're going to do today, inshallah. So I want us to redefine, redefine what love means. And we're going to do that by, by starting over, starting from, from, starting from scratch, inshallah. So where does love begin? Where does love begin? And before we go into that, I want to do a little bit of a tangent. And I want to talk to you guys about another topic that I really have a lot of passion for. It was actually, by the way, one of the topics that I proposed for tonight. But for some reason, everyone picked Love Decoded. I think, you know, college kids, you guys love talking about love. But I wanted to talk about the purpose of life. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put us on this earth? And I want to start with that. Because there's a beautiful uh, verse in the Quran that defines the human vision, our vision statement, our mission statement. Anyone here a business major, by any chance? A few of you guys, right? Did you guys ever take a class where you have to do like a business plan, right? <coughs> business plan, and typically like, you know, you want to define what the company's vision is or what their mission is, right? So any company out there, any, you know, any industry out there, any organization out there has a vision or a statement or a mission statement, right? of why that, that organization is being established. Nike has one, Adidas has one, Apple has one, Google has one, right? They all have one. And typically, the person that puts that organization together or builds that product, that inventor, right, knows that product better than anyone else, right? Knows it better than anyone else. The best examples of this are like, if you look at Facebook or at Google or even at Apple, right? A lot of the co-founders of these companies are actually also the guys that engineer this stuff, right? They're like the brains behind the company. So they, they know everything about it. And in the same way, our creator, Allah, right, knows everything about us, knows us inside and out. And he put us on this world for a reason. And he says in the Quran, in a, in a beautiful verse, you know, and you guys, inshallah, if you guys don't, don't know this verse, write it down, inshallah. It's in Surah 51. Surah 51, verse 50, okay? And you want to have it so I can show it here to you guys. If not, we could uh, maybe read it together, inshallah. Uh, Surah 51, actually verse 55. If you start with verse 55, Allah says in the Quran that He has created man and jinn to serve Him, to worship Him, okay? For no other reason except to serve Him and to worship Him, okay? And all, all you guys are probably thinking, yeah, I heard this verse before, we know this verse. But before that verse, Allah says that He's telling us this as a reminder. Because a reminder benefits the believer. You know, a lot of times, have you guys ever, you know, done something that your parents told you not to do? You don't have to raise your hand, but I did, right? I mean, like sometimes, no matter how many times your parents tell you not to do something, you kind of end up still doing it, right? 
So that's why as parents, you know, our parents are always trying to remind us about what to do and what not to do. So Allah is telling us in the Quran that He's giving us a reminder. He's telling us that He has created us for no other reason except to serve Him and to worship Him. And I want to start with that because that's important. Because when we're trying to define what love is, we have to go back to our Creator and see how Allah defined what true love is. Are you guys following? Does that make sense so far? Right? And Allah in the Quran, if you look at you know, the first surah that was revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu just the five verses, right? أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ اِقْرَأْ بِسْمِ رَبِّكَ الَّذِي خَلَقْ خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ عَلَقْ اِقْرَأْ وَرَبُّكَ الْأَكَرَكْ الَّذِي أَلَّمَا مِنْ قَلَمْ أَلَّمَ الْإِنسَانَ مَا لَمْ يَعْلَمْ صَدَقَ اللَّهُ الْعَظِيمُ So Allah is telling us that read in the name of your Lord who created it. Right? So Allah wants us to read this world in the name of the Lord who created it. Created what? Created this entire world. Right? Not only did He create us, but He created us and He taught us what we know not. Right? That's what the verse says, right towards the end, the fifth verse. It says He created man, but He also taught us what we know not. So Allah is the one that put us into this earth, but then also gave us the knowledge of things that we don't know. Right? So we have to understand from Allah's perspective how He Himself defines what love is. Okay? So let's look in the Quran to see how Allah defines what love should be. The first thing that Allah tells us is that true love True love, absolute true love, is for who? Is for Allah and our Prophet Is for Allah and our Prophet Right? And he says this in multiple verses in the Quran. But the example I want to show you guys is in Surah Baqarah, Surah 2. Surah 2, verse 164 and verse 165, inshaAllah. And it says, the, the main gist of these verses is that Allah is saying, but those who believe love Allah more than anything else. Okay? Here's the exact two verses. So, does someone want to read it? Inshallah, any, any volunteers to read? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, okay. Verily, the creation of the heavens and the earth, and in the alteration of night and day, and the ships that sail through the sea, with that which is of use to mankind, and the water, rain, which Allah sends down from the sky and makes the earth alive, there went after his death, and the moving, living creatures of all kinds that he has scattered therein, and in the veering of winds and clouds which are held between the sky and the earth, there indeed I have the people of understanding. Next one? Yes, please. And if mankind are some who take for worship others besides Allah's rivals to Allah, they love them as they love Allah, but those who believe love Allah more than anything else. If only those who do wrong and see, when they will see the torment, that all power belongs to Allah and have Allah's severe punishment. Thank you. So, Allah is setting the foundation of what true love is. And we'll, we'll get to why this is important. But Allah is saying that any love we have in this world cannot be more than the love that we have for who? That we have for Allah. Right? So that's example one. Example number two. In Surah 9, in Surah Tawbah, Right? Verse 24. Another volunteer? Anyone else want to read this verse? Yes. Say, if your fathers and your sons and your brothers and your spouses and your kinsmen and riches that you have gained and commerce who slightly you are apprehensive of and dwellings you are satisfied with, in case these are more beloved to you than Allah and His Messenger and striving in His way, then wait till Allah comes up with His command. And Allah does not guide the immoral people. The immoral people. Yeah, subhanAllah. Thank you. So in this verse, man, Allah is giving us the entire list, right? Allah is saying, if your fathers and your sons and your brothers and your spouses and your kinsmen, right, are greater in the love for Allah, then there's a problem. There's a problem with that, right? Because as humans, we have to understand that any love that we have has to come under the love of Allah, right? And this is why the Prophet ﷺ, he would say in a hadith, none of you will complete your faith until you love me more than your fathers or your sons. 
And in another narration, it goes on to say, and all of humanity all together. SubhanAllah, right? And this is why, you know, there's a famous story of the Prophet Wasallam and Umar al-Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, right? Once Umar came to the Prophet Wasallam and he said, Ya Rasulullah, I love you more than anyone else except myself. Except myself. And he said this and he was actually really happy. He thought he was going to make the Prophet Wasallam really excited by this news, right? Because he said, I love you more than anyone. More than my own mom, more than my own dad, my own kids, except for myself. And the Prophet ﷺ looked at him and he said, Umar, not yet. Meaning, you do not believe yet. You don't fully believe it. You haven't perfected your belief yet. And then Umar thought about this for a second. And he reflected. And then he came back to the Prophet ﷺ. And he said, Ya Rasulullah, I love you more than I love myself. Right? And then the Prophet said, Now you have reached belief. Now you believe that one. Right? So this shows us, have you guys heard this hadith before? I'm sure a lot of you guys have, right? It shows us and it defines to us that any love that we have can't be greater than the love that we have for who? For Allah. But then also for the Prophet. But let me ask you guys this. Why do you guys think that's important? Why is it important that any love that we have in this world has to be under the love of Allah and under the love of the Prophet Any thoughts? No right or wrong answer. Any? Any guesses? No? Yeah, go ahead. It reciprocates perfectly? It does, yeah. If you love Allah, then He will love you perfectly. And you will love everything because He created everything for you too. There you go, yeah. Very nice. Anyone else? Because if you can't love Allah, then you can't love anyone else. If you can't love Allah, you can't love anyone else. Yeah. Because if you can't love Allah and show Allah the love that He deserves, it's hard for us to love anyone else in this world, right? So let me give you guys some reasons why this is important. This is important because, first of all, think of it as the glue for your marriage. The glue that keeps any marriage or relationship together. Because let's be honest. You know, any relationship has good days and it has bad days, right? Even maybe with our own siblings, with our own parents. And marriage is the same as well, right? In marriages, you know, one day might be really good, right? The next day you wake up, you're having a bad day. Maybe your husband had a bad day at work. He comes by, he's complaining, get into an argument, the food is cold, doesn't taste good, right? On and on and on. But when you love Allah, and you love the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that marriage is always glued together through good times and through bad times. Our definition of how we should love each other is defined through Allah and through what the Prophet said. Because the Prophet he said, the best amongst you is the best to his family, and I am the best to my family. Did you guys hear this hadith before? Right? And there's two huge examples, uh, two lessons from this hadith. First of all, it shows us that by the Prophet saying that the best amongst you is the best to his family, it's showing us that being good to our families, like being a good husband or a good wife, or a good parent, maybe a good you know, son or a daughter, is actually a worship in our religion. It's a worship, right? So the best amongst us is the one that's best to our families. But then the Prophet he goes on to say that I am the best to my family. So by saying that, he is saying that he is, in fact, our role model of how we need to be as a husband, how we need to be within our homes, how we need to be as a father, as a parent, as a sibling. Right? So when we love Allah, and then we love our Prophet sometimes, we have to turn to him to understand what true love is, and see how he displayed love in his own house. Right? So when we do this, we understand that first of all, all the love that we have, first and foremost, is for Allah. Right? Done and done. After that, any love we have for our kids, our spouses, has to be under that love. That way, no one is fully in charge of your heart. Only Allah is always in charge of your heart. Your love, your heart is always filled with the love for Allah. So no matter what happens in your everyday life, no matter what happens in your everyday relationships, you always say this is from Allah. The good days we're having are from Allah. The bad days that Allah is testing us with are from Allah. 
All right, does that make sense? Yeah? Cool, inshallah. So think of it as the glue that keeps our marriages together, inshallah. So if you do this right, that there are so many different elements of love. Because typically when we define love, we think of it as a feeling, right? We think of it as a feeling that says, you know what? Yeah, I feel love today. But love is more than a feeling, it's a concept. It's a concept that consists of a lot of different attributes. It's the mercy that we show each other, right? It's the accountability that we have for each other. It's the trust that we have for each other. It's the gentleness that we show each other, right? It's the, it's the, the good days and bad days that we balance for each other. So love is more than a feeling, but it's a concept that we have to live to and use our minds, not just our hearts with, okay? And when we do this the right way, so if we, if we like we talked about, if we take away what society just tells us about what love is, because society typically talks about love just from the emotional aspect, right? Just from the emotional aspect. But our religion teaches us that there's more to it just than just the emotional aspect. There's the mental aspect to it. There's the, there's the aspect of being kind and merciful and being accountable and having that trusting relationship, inshallah. All right? So if we do this right, what we're doing is we're making sure that our loves and our, our love and our relationships are built to last. Because do you guys know a lot of the marriages in our society today, they're actually crumbling. You know, I'm not sure if you guys you know, read the stats about marriages and stuff like that, but they say the divorce rate in America today is around like 50%. 50%, that's pretty high. I mean, next time you guys go, you know, grocery shopping or staying in line at Target, it's out of the, you know, the 10 people in front of you, five of those families are probably impacted by a divorce. You know, a lot of the kids that we interact with are living in single families, and probably a lot of us here also probably know people or are from families that are divorced. And in the Muslim society, I mean, it's not, it's not a whole lot better. They say 31% of Muslims, their marriages end in divorce, 31%. And that study, I think, was last done in 2003. So I'm guessing that number is probably increasing over time. You know, that's just in the US. Yeah, that's, that's just in the US. And, you know, so, you know, I do a lot of counseling, even at the Plato Majid, at ICC, at Epic Majid, um, and just, just with different people. And I'll tell you, the biggest issues we see coming into the Majid, ask any Imam, any scholar, typically it has to do with problems in a marriage, problems in a family, right? And a lot of times that's because we don't really truly understand what love is. We bring the same expectations that we see in our society into our own marriages. We're not approaching it the way that Allah and our Prophet wants us to approach it, right? So not only people are getting, are getting divorced, but also you know, people are spending less and less time together after they get married. You know, like before, like when you first get married or when you just got engaged, studies show that people, the couple typically spend like 15 hours a week having a meaningful conversation. 15 hours a week. You know, like text messaging each other and, you know, um, emailing each other and so on and so forth, right? But after someone actually gets married, that number goes down from 15 hours a week to only 15 minutes a week. Pretty crazy, right? So, I mean, you know, we're so busy in our lives that when a marriage first comes together, we want to, you know, like, you know, it's like the honeymoon stage, right? We want to do everything to impress our spouses, so we're always having those conversations, but that time goes down. But not just that, studies have shown that, you know, marriages in America, six out of 10 people are not even happy in their marriages. That's, pretty, that's a pretty high number. So, we're saying five out of 10 are getting divorced, right? And then out of the ones that don't get divorced, six out of 10 are not even happy. Right? And then the stat at the bottom there says that 6 out of 10 Americans take part in, a, in that affair. And believe it or not, this impacts the Muslim community as well. There's, there's issues of the Muslim that we see there where people are, are falling into this, this trap of having affairs and stuff. So, so, I mean, subhanAllah, I mean, a lot of this happens because we actually don't know what to expect in the marriage. And we take incorrect expectations with us into our weddings, into our marriages. Right? You know, the average American spends around $30,000 for their wedding. Do you guys know that? Average wedding in America costs about $30,000. And I think a day to a little wedding probably costs a lot more than that. <laughs> we get like 600 people showing up, right? You know, when I was getting married, I, mean, I pulled over like at a Panera before my wedding, and there was like a family there going to my wedding, and I was like, I, never, I didn't even know them, you know? So, <laughs> I walked in with my, you know, the, 
put the pajama on at the tournament. And they're like, oh, you're going to the wedding? I'm like, yeah. You know, and they're like, yeah, we're going to that wedding too. So, <laughs> right? So, I'm sure we spend a lot more money than thirty thousand dollars for our wedding. And you know, we're spending all this money in our marriages and our weddings, but we're not really planning for our actual marriages, right? We put so much time planning for our weddings, but we don't plan for our marriage that takes place after that, right? We go about, you know, picking the right outfit, getting the right photographer, getting the right hall, making sure everything is perfect, which there's nothing wrong with that, right? But we have to make sure that after we have this beautiful wedding, that our marriages are also filled with beauty and peace and mercy and tranquility that Allah wants in our marriages, inshallah. All right, so I'm gonna move on to our, our next part, inshallah. So hopefully that gives us a foundation, a grounding of what true love is in our team. All right, so quick recap. True love is what? Love for Allah and our Prophet because that is the glue that defines our marriages, our weddings, our relationships. And any time something happens in our marriages, any disagreements, any hard time, any good time, we go back to what? We go back to Allah and His Messenger to define how to solve that problem. Because Allah is our creator, He's our owner, our caretaker, and He is the one that can best define how to solve those issues. All right, so um, part number two, finding the right spouse. Finding the right, right spouse. So how do we go about finding the right person for us? So here's a little activity for you guys, inshallah. I want you guys to list three to five attributes that you want in your future spouse, okay? Three to five attributes that you want in your future spouse. And if you are already married, list three to five attributes that you hope to have within yourself that will, inshallah, improve your marriage even more, okay? So list three to five attributes that you want in your future spouse. And for a lot of you guys, you're probably like, I never thought about this, this is the first time I'm thinking about it. As long as he or she is looking, I'm good, right? But really, <laughs> so, you know, um, you know, that's typically true, right? I mean, a lot of times, I mean, if you think about it, even think about it from our parents' perspective, right? Most bio data, or if you ever read like Islamic Horizons, you know, you know, if you go to like the back of the magazine, you look for like those, uh, you, know, you know, what are they called? You know, people are looking to get married and stuff like that, right? Description, you know, like fair skinned medical doctor looking for six foot five, two foot five, well built attorney that cannot speak Tulu as your first language. You know what I mean, right? So, like, very clear definitions of what people want. But does that really define success in a marriage, right? So what is it? What is it that you think you guys want to look for in, uh, in your, your future spouses? I'm afraid to ask the guys. So uh, maybe for some sisters, uh, so the brothers can learn what sisters want in marriage, right? That's why we're crazy. Uh, sisters, any, what is it that, so I won't put you guys on the spot, just what is it that you guys think are important elements to have in a future spouse. <laughs> Anyone? What are some important elements or attributes or characteristics to have in your future spouse? Yeah. Someone who's passionate, passionate about what they do. Okay, passionate about what they're doing. So they have a cause in their life, right? Good one. Yeah. An Islamic foundation. Islamic foundation. So a common goal of maybe becoming religious together, right? Because we not know that's necessarily that. like not like a shit, huh? Like, <laughs> like who knows like a basic <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. There you go. There you go. It's not a shit, but someone that knows French frogs, playing three at a time, or wasting all the rooms in the weather, right? Things like that. So that that's important. What else? Humor. Humor. Yeah. At the end of the day, we want someone that we enjoy being with, right? You know, just because I said your love for Allah doesn't mean that we, you know, we just want this religious person and so on and so forth. But we want someone whose company that we enjoy. I mean, because you're going to wake up every single day looking at that person, right? So make sure it's someone that you actually, you know, a someone like to look at. But also, <laughs> they have a personality and a characteristic that you enjoy, which is more important than how they look. Yeah. They want like a good day, five times a day. 
yeah, good email, right? I mean, do they pray five times a day? Or if they don't pray five times a day, because then all of us may or may not, sometimes we forget, sometimes you know, we're all human, but they're there to remind each other, right? That's one of the beauties of religion is that, you know, our marriages are actually supposed to help us become closer to God, closer to God, not further away from God, right? So they're there to help us to become, inshallah, better, better people. Anyone else? Yeah, right. Somebody is capable of raising your kids. So raising your kids. Okay, good. Yeah, so someone that's, because I mean, at the end of the day, the person you're marrying is going to be the father or the mother of your kids, right? I mean, that's long term thinking. That's good. So you want to make sure whoever that person is, that they're able to raise your kids the way you want them to be raised. You want them to be raised in a way that's beneficial for society, beneficial for your home, own home. Going back to the verse we talked about, right? Brings that comfort or that coolness to your eyes. Those are the type of kids that we want. There's another hand on this side. Uh, confidence. Confidence. Like they're, you know, they're self -image. They're self what? They're self -image. Okay. So they're happy with who they are. They're happy with who they are, right? They're, they're confident with who they are. You know, a lot of times, you know, unfortunately, society, especially media, has this really gross way of over beautifying people. You know. They make humans almost, you know, fake, right? I mean, like, if you look at celebrities or athletes, whoever they are, I mean, the amount of makeup that they put on these people, let it be a guy or a girl, I mean, you know? Um, they're in the makeup room before they show up on TV, right? Uh, I mean, they, unfortunately, society has grown to show that humans have to look perfect. They have to fit this model, right? And, I mean, you're right, brother. I mean, a lot of times, we have to just be confident and with who we are. We have to be content that this is how Allah created us. Right? Allah knows why He created us the way He did. And we have to be happy with that destiny. And we also want our, our spouses to be happy with that. Anyone else? Understanding. Understanding. Someone who is understanding, who knows us, who knows what we're going through, who is there for us through good days and bad days, right? So, uh, yeah, everything you guys are saying is right on. Perfect. And everything I think we mentioned could be dropped into one of these four categories, right? There's a physical aspect, right? You know, we do want someone that might be, you know, a, a someone that's pleasing to, to look at or, or we're happy with the way they look or they're happy with their own self-confidence, their self-image, right? There's also the emotional part, right? We want someone that, you know, who relates to us, who knows us, who cares for us. We want someone that might be intellectual or educated, Someone we could have an intellectual conversation with, right? You know, society also wants someone that's spiritual. Let it be a Muslim or a non-Muslim, right? A lot of times people are looking to have a, you know, their soulmate. Someone that they could have a, you know, inshallah, you know, grow spiritually in this world, right? As a Muslim or even as a non-Muslim. So all of our marriages are all the attributes that we typically look for in a spouse will fall into one of these four categories, right? And this is why the Prophet them, he said a person could marry someone, marry a wife or, or a woman for four reasons. For four reasons. Have you guys heard this hadith before? Yes. For four reasons. What's reason number one? Her beauty. Say again? Was it her, her religion? So religion's one. Religion's one. What else? The wealth. I think someone said wealth. Beauty. Beauty. Family. Family status. Family status, right? So the Prophet ﷺ, he said that someone, a woman or even a husband, or even a guy, could be married for four reasons, right? For their physical beauty, for their family status, for their wealth, or for their religion. And he said to marry the one, marry for their religion, because if you do not, you are a loser. SubhanAllah, that's actually the words he uses, you are a loser. And to the point of the brother, he said over there, that you know, the wife doesn't have to be a shia, huh? the husband doesn't have to be a shia. But you want to make sure that the religion is there, the foundation of the religion is there. Because that defines how happiness will be defined in your marriage, right? Because if the foundation is good, if the religion is good, they themselves will strive to be like the Prophet and how he was in his own home. How he was loving with his spouse. How he showed his gentleness at home, right? So religion should be the basis of what we look for. And then if we get everything else, that's, you know, that's even better, right? There's nothing wrong with trying to find all four of these categories. There's nothing wrong with that, you know? 
but the focus cannot be just on the physical beauty. It just can't be on the wealth. It can't just be on the family status. Why? Why do you guys think it can't just be on those elements? They're materialistic, right? And what happens over time to other attributes? Fade away. They can fade. They can fade, right? I mean, how we look today isn't the way we looked 10 years ago, and isn't the way we really look 10 years from now. Yes? Well, we think that we can't control how they're going to end up. We can't, yeah, we can't control how we're going to end up. I mean, you know, some of this amazing example of people that were even like the example of Prophet Ayyub alayhi salam, right? And how Allah tested him, right? And, you know, so we are always, we could be afflicted with diseases or, or physical challenges after we get married, maybe we get in a car accident, right? Are we still going to love that person that we committed our life to just because they've changed how they physically look, right? So religion has to be at the foundation of that. Number two, we want to look for someone that has a good character or characteristics that we're looking for, right? So number one, we want someone that's, you know, on par with how we define religion. But then we also want someone that has the characteristics that we want, or good characteristics. And this is, this is really important. Because a lot of times, you know, a person that might have the physical beauty, right, they might be wealthy, but are they, are their manners good? Do they, good, do they have good akhlaq? Do they have good characteristics? That's something you have to ask yourself. Because you'll be waking up with this person every single day. You'll be raising your kids with this person every, you know, throughout the rest of your life. This person will be with you until you die, right? So do you, you want to make sure that you have someone whose characteristics are pleasing to you and you and you can balance off those characteristics as well. And this is why the Prophet said he actually said multiple times in, in different in different hadith that it's important for us to find someone that have a good characteristic. And the Prophet he said in the hadith, verily, you do not enrich the people with your wealth, but rather you enrich them with your, cheer, your cheerful faces and your good character. So we're not benefiting people around us with the wealth which Allah has given us as much as we could benefit them by the demeanor and the characteristic that we have. Right? In another hadith, the Prophet said, the most complete believer is the best in character. The best in character and the best to his, to, to his wife. So not only is the best in the character, but he's also the best to his wife. So even the Prophet is defining that the character is something that is really important when we look at a future spouse, inshallah. Number three, you want to make sure that you have common goals and common interests. You want to make sure that you guys have something common, you know, in your marriage. It doesn't have to be sports, you know, it doesn't have to be the same movie or the same genre of music, so on and so forth. But you want to make sure that the goals that you have in life are aligned, that they're the same, right? For example, you know, some brothers want a wife that doesn't work, that they want her to stay home and raise the family, so on and so forth, right? And, but there, there might be, the, the wife might be someone that wants to have a career. She wants to, you know, get a job, nothing wrong with that. But you have to have those expectations established and discussed before you get married. Because a lot of times what happens is, and we'll get to this example, is sometimes the husband has one expectations, the wife has another set of expectations. People end up getting married, they have no idea what those expectations are. And they find out about them after they get married. And a lot of issues and conflicts arise just because those expectations were not defined or set before people actually got married. All right? So you want to make sure that the goals and interests are there. And lastly, and most importantly, you want to ask Allah. You want to ask Allah. You want to make dua to Allah and understand that Allah is on your side when it comes to finding that special person, finding the right person. Do this to God, right? Ask Allah to guide you and ensure that the person you're finding is the right person. And Allah will open the doors for you. You know, a lot of times we feel like this is something that, you know, we gotta hide behind the back of everyone, we gotta hide behind the, you know, the back of our parents. But we have to understand that, you know, Allah loves us and He's our Creator and He wants the best for us. So if He wants the best for us, no matter how difficult the situation seems, ask Him to open the doors, the doors of His mercy and His ease. And He will do that, inshallah. He'll make it easy for you, inshallah. Alright? 
The other thing I want to talk to you guys about when we're looking for a spouse is the parent hurdle, right? How do we convince our parents that we're actually ready to get married? You know, because I think a lot of times, maybe you know who you want to get married to, you know what characteristics you want to find in your spouse, but you have no idea how you bring up this topic to your parents. <laughs> no idea. Because whatever you do, they laugh at you, maybe they're like, you know, you will get married? Yeah, you're not ready for this, right? So you want to, you know, kind of start preparing your parents for this discussion as well. And I have to be honest with you, you know, a lot of times, you know, people come up to me and they say, hey, look, I want to get married, but my parents, they're not convinced that I'm ready to get married. And, but then when you look at that person's life, you can tell that, you know, that person isn't, you know, they can't keep a job, right? Maybe they're not responsible. Maybe they don't have a trusting relationship with their parents, right? So their parents are looking at them as someone that isn't ready for marriage, right? Looking at them as someone that's not ready for marriage. So if you go to that, if you go to your parents and say, hey, look, I want to get married, but you're barely making it in school, you know, you can't, uh, you know, come home on time, you're not showing them responsibilities, they themselves may not think you're ready for marriage, right? So one of the tips I want to tell you guys is that if, you're ready, if you think you're ready for marriage, you want to convince your parents that, hey, look, you're ready to get married, you, know, you got to start like dropping hints to them, right? Maybe start like doing stuff around the house without them even asking, <laughs> right? Maybe you know, try to make some money on the side. Maybe you're out like shopping at the Indian store with your parents and say, hey, you know what, that, that outfit looks really nice, you know? And, It'd be really nice for my future wife or my future husband, right? So, so at least you can open the door to this conversation with them. You know, they're like, wow, mom is, why is he looking at her outfit? You know, like, in the, they'll, like, start thinking, like, hey, yeah, maybe he's ready to have this discussion, right? So you want to make sure that you're, you're kind of giving them the hints, besides, like, randomly showing up one day for dinner and saying, hey, I think I found this girl, and I think she looks really good, and, you know, we talked online, and... We're thinking about getting married in a couple months. And, you know what I mean? Like, you know, like at least give them like advance notice that you're even thinking about getting married. And hopefully, inshallah, they'll help you along the journey. You know what I mean? They'll help you make this happen, inshallah. Um, you know, and don't be shy about having that conversation with your parents. I think a lot of times a lot of us run away from it because, I mean, truthfully, it is kind of awkward, right? I mean, how do you pull it off? I mean, like at dinner, like all your siblings sitting around and saying, hey, you know, mom. I think about getting married, what do you think? You know, I mean like it's it's kind of hard, right? But like you have to at least give it a chance. See how your parents react to it. Because a lot of times they actually might be supportive of it, but inside of us we don't know that. So what do we do? We try to work around their backs to make this happen, and we actually make things more difficult for us. Because a lot of times our parents can be our biggest allies when it comes to getting married, right? But a lot of times we end up doing something that turns them off from this whole process and you know they make it a little bit harder for us to get married, right? So try opening this up, having this conversation with your parents and child. How you guys doing? You guys want to take a little break or are you guys good? No, we're good. No, we're good. You guys good? All right. We're ready to get married, guys. <laughs> All right, so, so we talked about what is true love. Then we talked about, you know, how to find that right, the right person, how to find that, you know, the right special person, how to have that conversation with your spouse, or with, your, with your parents, about your future spouse. Now let's talk about, inshallah, what are some of the keys to a successful relationship? How do you make sure that once you do get married, that your marriage is filled with the tranquility and the mercy and the love, which Allah defines and talks about in the Quran, all right? So the first thing we have to do in anything that we do, any action we do, because we know from the hadith of the Prophet all of our actions are based on what? Are based on intention, right? The reward we get for our actions are based on the intention that we have for that action. This is the first hadith that, the, that even Imam Bukhari recorded in his books, right? So any action that we do, let it be coming to school, let it be you know, working, let it be praying our salah, not just our worship, but even our non-worship, right? We should make the intention of doing it to please Allah and for it to be our worship for us. In the same way when it comes to having a successful marriage and even looking for a successful spouse. Make that intention. And right when you make that intention, it does a couple of things. One, it makes sure that you have a pure relationship. It forces you to say, you know what? If I'm truly doing this to please Allah, 
to gain reward from Allah. I want to make sure that this is a, a purely halal relationship. So even maybe before you get married, maybe you, you know who that spouse is, who that person is that you want to get married to. You're having, you know, you're, you're talking to them. You're kind of getting emotionally attached to them. If you have the right intention, it will, inshallah, stop you from doing anything wrong. And saying, you know what, this is getting kind of serious now. Let's make sure that we get our families involved, let's get our parents involved, and so on and so forth. Does that make sense, right? So we want to make sure that we have the right intention before we even get started um, in, our, in our marriages or in our relationship. You guys, also understand that marriage is about self-improvement. Marriage is about self-improvement. You know, a lot of times, the biggest mistakes that we do in our marriages, we often, you know, blame our spouse whenever something goes wrong, right? Typically, you know, you come home, food's not ready, you're upset, you get angry, you start yelling at your wife. A lot of times, brothers, I hate to say it, the problem I hear with you, maybe you have anger problems. Maybe you have the wrong expectations that your wife has to cook for you every single day, right? Maybe you have the wrong expectations based upon society. Maybe we haven't done our, our research to see what religion is, right? So a lot of times, a lot of the problems that we have we see in marriages is not because the husband is bad or the wife is bad, because the individual themselves has things that they have to improve, okay? So whenever I do these workshops for like married couples, the first thing I say in the beginning is that, you know, don't go home and say that, you know what, brother, my said a wife should be this way, or brother, my said a husband should be that way. You know, marriage is about self-improvement. So it's about how do you become a better person so your marriage is actually fulfilled and is more rewarding for both of you guys. All right? Does that make sense? So like for example, like you know, if you know that you're someone that's not gentle, maybe you don't have mercy, right? But you know your spouse is someone that loves mercy. She loves gentleness, right? She loves when you buy her flowers. You know, it's really hard to overcome that. But you gotta fix that in yourself to make your spouse happy as well. Right? Or maybe you're lazy. Maybe you have a laziness problem inside of you. And you're blaming your wife for everything that's happening at home. Or even your husband. Right? But you yourself are lazy. Are lazy. So you have to improve that in yourself. So marriage a lot of times is important. It's about self-improvement. And this is why the Prophet said that your, your marriage is half of your faith. Did you guys hear this hadith? <coughs> marriage is half of your faith. And the Prophet he said this because typically after you get married, you're often tested to see how strong your faith is. You're tested to see if you're, if you're going to be a good wife, if you're going to be a good husband, if you're actually going to be patient, if you're actually going to be forgiving, if you're going to be trustworthy, right? All these things get tested after you get married. This is why the Prophet Sallallahu he said that. So marriage doesn't mean, you know, because a lot of times people see this hadith and say, you know what? I'm now becoming more religious just because I got married. My beard has become like halfway more longer, right? And I'm going to be super religious just because I'm married. It actually means that because you're married, yes, you'll have more sakina. Maybe your, your, you know, your desires are more fulfilled. You feel more you know, at peace. However, the tests that you go through are just as strong, are just as strong, right? And if not more. So you have to be able to live up to those tests and, and still be a good person, right? Spending meaningful time with your spouse. I think this is huge. You know, we live in a society where a lot of us, a lot of our, you know, both the husband and the wife work together, right? So how many hours did I say a couple spends talking before they get married? 15. 15 hours. And how, how much does that go down to after they get married? 15 minutes. 15 minutes, right? So it's important for any marriage to be successful that you make time to actually have a meaningful, eventful, um, like relationships and, and companionship in your life. And if you look at the life of the Prophet I mean, there's some amazing, amazing stories of how he did this, even though he was the Prophet, even though he was a, the leader of our Ummah, even though he was a political leader, a military leader, right? The Prophet وسلم, he made time to build memories with his spouses. And there's a beautiful example, a couple of beautiful examples I'll give you guys. Inshallah. One is the example of the Prophet وسلم, when he was traveling with his companions in Aisha radiallahu anha. She was traveling with them as well. Okay? So during the, during the travel, the Prophet وسلم, 
he told his companions to go ahead, to move ahead, right? So he made them kind of go ahead, so, so there was some distance, some privacy between him and Aisha and his companions. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he looked at Aisha and he said, let's race, let's race. So he was challenging his wife to a race, right? So imagine the Prophet ﷺ and Aisha, right? They're in this open field, and what do they do? They race down the field, right? And the first time around this happens, guess who wins the race? All of those in the Prophet, right? It was Aisha, Aisha. It was Aisha that won the race. So he won, she won the race. And then a few years later, right, the exact same scenario happens. The Prophet is like he's traveling with his companions. And he tells his companions to go ahead to move forward. And he challenges Aisha to a race again, right? And I mean, this is like a serious race, you know? Like the Prophet actually wants to, you know, he wants to win now. So he, he challenges to the race, and guess who wins the second time? The Prophet. All the sisters of Aisha. The Prophet. He won, right? And he looked at Aisha, and he said, this victory is for the previous defeat. So he's talking some trash here, right? He's telling you, he's telling you, he's saying that, hey, look, this victory, me winning this race now, is for that first time you beat me. And then in the narration, Aisha, she gives a justification for why she lost. Right? A good sport, right? She says, oh, this is after some time and I gained some weight, right? So I wasn't as fast as I used, I used to be. So the Prophet won, right? So that's an amazing story. I mean, subhanAllah, here we are, like, you know, reading stories about like Romeo and Juliet and, you know, stories of like, you know, how the Taj Mahal was built, right? So on and so forth. But like, our Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he's giving us the true definition of how to be a husband who can make time for his spouse even though he was the prophet of the Ummah. Amazing, right? How the story was passed down to us, generation after generation, so we could sit here and understand it. And by the way, this was just Aisha and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, it's amazing how she shared this story with us, right? Because she could have just kept it to herself. But she shared it so it could be an example for us. So the biggest lesson for us brothers, A, sometimes let your wives win when you challenge her something, to something. But B, if she does win, make sure you, you know, talk some trash and, and win the second time around. <laughs> no, okay. But it's, you know, it's an amazing example for us to, to make the time to build these relationships. And the Prophet Sallallahu he was like this with, you know, with all of his, his spouses. Even with Khadija. I mean, with Khadija, the Prophet Sallallahu he had an amazing relationship with her. And, you know, we all know that the Prophet Sallallahu was younger than Khadija, but he found so much comfort in her. So much emotional, you know, fulfillment in her. You know, she was the one that gave birth to his, to his children, right? She was the one that the Prophet Sallallahu after Revelation came to him. She was the one that he came to, to seek comfort, to seek protection, right? And she comforted him. And even after she passed away, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam could always remember her, right? Whenever he heard like a knock on the door of his house, he would say, let it be the sister of Khadija. I mean, that's amazing, right? Even after she passed away, he wanted to see her sister because her sister reminded him so much of her. SubhanAllah. That's amazing. That's like one of us seeing our, like our, you know, our sister-in-laws in the future, like after our wife passed away and saying, You're so, you, you love your wife so much that even your sister-in-law brings you that happiness of how your wife was. I and mean, that's a true definition of what love is, right? So our Prophet Sallallahu was able to make time to have his, his, these memories within, within his, his own home and his marriages. Lastly, you know what, I think a lot of times we seek perfection when it comes to our relationships. You know, we want the other person to be perfect. You know, and a lot of times that's just because our society defines how we should be. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he warned us against this. He said that if we find anything that we dislike about a woman, focus on the things that bring happiness to us about her, right? So overlook the small mistakes that she has and focus on all the good that she brings to us. So overlook any small bad habit or annoying habit that she has and focus on all the happiness and the love and the mercy that they bring to us. And this applies to both husbands and wives, right? So overlook the small mistakes that we make and don't seek perfection. Because perfection is only with Allah. Allah is truly perfect, right? And we are humans. And none of us can be perfect. 
So we can't see perfection from our spouses as well. So as I mentioned to you guys earlier, it's important for us to have the right expectations when it comes to our marriages. So it's important before we get married or even after we get married, we define what expectations we have for our spouse. Okay? Here's a quick scenario. If someone wants to read it out loud, we can talk about it. Anyone, any other volunteers to... Yeah. Someone else maybe. Someone different. There you go. After Fatima completed her medical school, she married her fiancé, Ayaz. Fatima always dreamed of working for a couple of years and then becoming a housewife when they decided to have children. Ayaz, on the other hand, was grateful that he was able to marry Fatima, who was so educated and soon to be doctor. Since Ayaz did not make nearly as much income as Fatima, he was hopefully that he was hopefully that her additional income would reduce some of his financial burden. Okay. Anyone named Ayaz here for Fatima? No. Okay. Good. Um, so, um, so what do you guys see in this lesson? What do you guys What do you guys notice? They did not define their career goals. Yeah. So they didn't define career goals, right? So Fatima wanted to do what? She wanted to work, right? There's nothing wrong with that. She wanted to work. But her husband didn't expect that. Ayaz didn't expect that, right? And he came into his marriage thinking that, you know what? She's going to continue working. She's going to make some money. And it's going to help our family out, right? Financially. But she decided that, hey, you know what? I'd rather spend time with my kids. I want to make sure that I'm there for them. But they never had this discussion, right? And now, a lot of times, if we don't have these expectations set correctly, and we don't define these expectations, they can cause conflict in a marriage. So one of the things that we have to do is, first of all, we ourselves have to understand what is it that we're expecting from our spouse, from our future spouse, okay? And communicate that to them, either before we get married, like maybe through pre-marriage counseling or so on and so forth, or otherwise afterwards, so we're all on the same page. So you guys are on the same page with your future spouse, inshallah. So with that, I actually want you guys to do another activity for you guys to also done. So this time around, I want you guys to define two things that you want to improve in yourself before you get married. So what are two things that you think you need to improve in yourself to inshallah have a successful marriage? Alright? Is it, you know, do you have anger problems? Do you have problems trusting other people? Do you have problems being honest? Do you have problems with, with um, open communication? So what is it inside yourself? What is it with yourself that you want to improve before you get married? 